this is Porikip Ghosh from the Delhi School of Economics. On behalf of Ideas for India, today I'm welcoming Professor David Green. David is a professor at the Vancouver School of Economics in uh, the University of British Columbia, and also an international fellow at the Institute for Fiscal Studies. David, thank you very much for sparing us your time today. Oh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, so David is a labor economist, primarily. I uh, hate to box you in like that, David, but that <laughs> is probably your main identity within our discipline. So today I was hoping to pick your brains and seek your uh, opinions and thoughts about a problem which all around the world is recognized to be a major problem, which is rising levels of inequality. Uh, that we have seen in the last three to four decades. Let me quickly show a couple of graphs which will illustrate what I'm talking about. So this is the share of income going to the top 10% in the United States. And it's tracked for over a century. This data comes from the very influential work of Piketty, Says, and Zuckman. And what we see here is that the share of the top 10% came down significantly after you know, the New Deal programs and especially after the war. And it remained low, relatively speaking, historically, till about the beginning of the 80s. And then there's a significant increase once again. Uh, and we see similar patterns, if not as pronounced as the United States. So uh, several decades of declining inequality. And it doesn't depend on the measure. You can look at you know, Gini coefficients and other measures. You see a probably similar pattern, uh, which is decline from the, in the post-war period for about three or four decades, and then followed by another four decades of increasing inequality. So much so that as far as pre-tax income share of the top 10% is concerned, it's almost back to the pre-depression levels. Uh, which is remarkable because Western societies, developed economies have undergone massive changes since the depression, right? The welfare state came in and all kinds of taxes and transfers uh, were brought in. So this is the focus uh, or the, at least the launching pad for our discussion today, David. So people have been talking about what may have caused this, this dramatic shift in the last four decades. One Usual suspect is, of course, trade and globalization. Uh, another possibility is immigration, I and mean, in some of the political debates, that plays a prominent role. Uh, then there's automation. You know, more jobs are being automated. Machines are replacing humans, so that could be one of the forces. And then uh, people talk about various policy changes since the Reagan-Thatcher era. Policies have uh, drifted uh, to the right. Uh, there's been a decline in union power taxes and transfers, social programs have been cut, and so on. So my first broad question to you is, uh, as someone who has studied these labor markets, uh, the Canadian labor market in particular, but also US and uh, mature economies labor markets over for the last several decades, how do you see as the cause behind this rising input? I think one of the things that's interesting when you get into this area is some of the things that economists, or at least empirical economists, think they know, I think some of them would be surprising uh, to, to sort of regular people on the street. So, so a good example of that one is the immigration one, which, as you said, you know, that the particularly sort of right-wing populists have really taken that on, made it a focus of blame, the sort of argument that immigrants come in and they steal jobs is the phrase used and lower wages. But I think surprisingly to a lot of people, the consensus in economics is that uh, immigration has almost no effect, um, at least in the medium term. And a lot of that comes from evidence based on examining cities and states. What happened to wages and employment after you had a big influx of immigration in the you know, grandparent of this whole literature, the starting point is a paper by David Card from Berkeley about the Muriel Boatlift. It's in about 1980, uh, Fidel Castro suddenly said, everybody can leave who wants to leave. But there was, there was no real way for them to leave Cuba. But so what happened over the next five months is people got on anything that floated and lots of things that didn't float and tried to get across to Miami. And then from the other side, from Miami came a flotilla of votes that even picked them up. 
And in that five month period before Castro closed the door again, the Miami labor force increased by 7% in a five month period, which is astronomically large for immigration inflows. And then uh, what David did was he basically tracked forward and said, well, what happened in Miami versus other cities that looked a lot like Miami beforehand? And what you find is in Miami, wages went down for during the first year, but they recovered. And by about three years out, which really think about this, this is not very long out, but employment rates were back to where they were relative to the other places. Wages were back to where they were. There was almost no evidence of a particularly big negative impact. And, and that finding has been replicated in various different settings in various different countries, dictates the way economists, labor economists at least, look at immigration now. So this argument that, that immigration is this huge negative force that's driving inequality in developed economies, there's just no evidence for it. It's, on the other hand, the people who claim that immigration is the savior of the economy, there's no great evidence for that either. But uh, that's just one example of how you know, the evidence is somewhat different from what I think people sometimes think. Isn't there a bit of a debate among labor economists, especially uh, you know, uh, George Borjas, uh, his view that very unskilled labor they are hurt by immigration because they are the ones who are facing competition from the immigrants. In the Miami example, you know, most of the immigrants were, were low skilled. So if you decompose the effects and look at the unskilled workers, people working in restaurants and stuff like that, uh, don't we find an effect there? It's a good point. It's part that sort of gets into the nitty gritty of that literature. So it's true, George Borjas wrote a paper that said, uh, almost exactly what you said in the Miami labor force by using somewhat different techniques. Giovanni Perry from UC Davis wrote quite a strong rebuttal of that Borjas point in that particular context. Now, with that said, there is also evidence uh, that, as you're saying, it's, it's uneven what happens to, to wages uh, overall when immigration comes in. It turns out that the main negative impact on wages is for previously arrived immigrants. What really seems to happen is that lower skilled uh, native born shift towards jobs where the host lang country language is important. So they'll shift to ones that are more sort of front facing in shops. The immigrants pick up the jobs where Im immigration is less important. And who are they competing with on those jobs? Well, previously arrived immigrants. So there is a sort of evidence that there's a negative impact. It's very localized in a sense within the economy. Right. That makes sense. Uh, but uh, anyway, the international movement of people is very limited, right? It's, it's much smaller in volume than the movement of goods. So, so what do you think has been the impact of uh, trade uh, and also technological change like automation? In the, in the yeah, West? it's really interesting. Again, I think trade is, and I'm really interested to hear what you think, but trade is a particularly complex one, right? So there have been a whole set of studies looking at what happened when trade for China opened up really substantially around 2000. Um, and what the evidence there is, particularly in parts of the US um, and other developed economies where there was a real concentration of manufacturing of industries that were going to compete directly with China, there you see falls in employment, falls in wages. Uh, and that often I think sort of takes over the conversation. People say, okay, so trade is this inequality inducing thing. But I think it's important to, to think about the other side of trade, who's benefiting from this trade in terms of the workers who are doing the work that's now being sold. On a global level, one would say that, that at the very least, it's not unsure and I think probably more in the direction of trade being a positive force for reducing inequality on a global level. Then there's other complications, right? So one of the things trade does is it reduces the cost and particularly it's reduced the cost of lower, of, of goods that are produced with more low-skilled labor. Well, who buys that? Those goods will, it tends to be people who have lower incomes, even in a developed economy. So trades have this sort of subtle impact of keeping the cost of living down. So that's working against these wage loss issues. And then finally, there are economies, for example, after about 2000, Canada's inequality trend goes flat. And as far as I know, Australia does the same. And a lot of what was happening there is Canada really benefited from being able to sell resources in a hot resource market. So trade in that sense really brought wages up in Canada and employment up and the same in Australia. And so in Canada, 2000s was actually quite a good labor market decade when it was a disastrous one in the US. So it, it's sort of like trade is a very, a very complex force, honestly. So in the US also, uh, 
you know, natural resource extraction picked up in the last 20 years, right? All the fracking and the shale oil. So it wasn't enough in the U.S. to compensate or those opportunities came out elsewhere, like in the Midwestern Rust Belt got hollowed out, but all the fracking was happening in Arizona and Texas and places like that. That's a good point. I think there's a couple of things. One is the U.S. is just not nearly as resource development an economy as Canada and Australia. You're right. They definitely benefited from those trends. It just wasn't as important for the economy as a whole. I've worked on some papers that suggest that when you get something like a fracking boom in one part of the economy, it does reach over to other parts of the economy. That is, workers move from the Rust Belt, and that has benefits even back in the Rust Belt. It's just sort of not big enough relative to the whole size of the American economy to undo what was being done in the manufacturing sector. That was my take on it. So some economies were net winners from what happened in the resource boom and the expansion of trade in the 2000s. The U.S. was a net loser. And, and one of the things that happens is we all tend to focus on the U.S. Like that's the, it's sort of the center of our profession. It's also, you know, the thing that we all read about. Everybody pays attention to their sports and their music. So somehow or another, it looms super large. When you look at some of these issues, they're not quite the same in the rest of the world. In this context, the whole discourse, uh, both in theory as well as in, you know, sort of empirical understanding of what's going on, you know, our theory tells us that things like um, international trade with regard to comparative advantage and everything goes increase the size of the pie. But then as a rejoinder, theory also tells us that beware of distributive effects, right? There will be winners and losers and we have to somehow uh, handle that. Now, some of the forces of uh, what we're talking about, uh, so uh, what has happened in the US economy, I have to take that as the leading example, although you were sort of um, uh, warning against that, uh, is that you know some regions went into decline. So the Midwest, the Rust Belt really uh, went into a deep decline, but then some other regions have prospered like Silicon Valley, the Western United States, and more recently the South, right? Uh, that's prospering and coming up. And I, I guess you see this reflected in voting patterns too, you know, Democrat, Republican, right? Now, of course, in a frictionless world where people could reinvent themselves and move, right, from the declining regions to the prosperous, if, if they can move from the Rust Belt to the Silicon Valley and reinvent themselves from uh, factory workers, welders to software programmers, then the distribution wouldn't be a problem. So my question to you as, as somebody who has st studied labor market for a long time, you know, how much friction is there on these two fronts? Geographical mobility, people moving around to take advantage of the opportunities arising elsewhere, and people's ability to shift occupations, professions, reinvent their skills and so on. Those both are really important. My belief is there's very considerable frictions in both of those. I think one of the things that we tend to underplay in economics that I think most people recognize as obvious is the importance of communities. And so you get in these situations where people are not willing to make those geographic moves you're talking about because of the communities are so important. So there's an old literature actually that looked at the question of welfare magnets and did, do people move in order to go and get better welfare benefits? This was actually a US, a largely US literature, but they looked at places where you looked right along a state border and you could see people living in, I think it was Michigan, where the, the benefits were not very good. And by moving like 20 miles, they could have been in Wisconsin where the benefits were quite good. And you see very little movement of that kind. And then when you go and talk to people and ask what's going on, well, the answer is really, I get a lot of support from my community. Like my parents take care of my child when I have to suddenly work an odd shift and somebody else gives me food and and so all of those things hold people in place. And that means that the kinds of Ricardian forces you're talking about are very long-term forces. And when we count the costs of trade, we should be taking those long-term transitions into account. Uh, there's an interesting example. Canada has a free trade agreement with the U.S. When that was first initiated, there was this sort of recognition that there would be winners and losers. And so they set up a fund, which was officially so that anyone who lost their job because of the trade would get retraining, would get uh, money to be, you know, move somewhere else. And that fund was almost never used because nobody could really prove who had lost their job due to trade. So there was sort of this beforehand recognition, but after the fact, the right. inequality in, in impacts happened nonetheless. Right. 
I, I, just as an aside, David, when this NAFTA was being signed, right? Uh, this is the early days of the Clinton administration. Remember that uh, Ross Perot had a debate with Al Gore mm-hmm. on television. I was a graduate student then, and uh, you know, it was fascinating. Public policy was being debated in such a prominent way. And Ross Perot said that you know jobs uh, will disappear south of the border. He was referring to Mexico. Uh, because that was a lower age economy, that jobs will disappear with a sucking sound, right? <laughs> the folksy Texan way of speaking. And among, I, you know, I was in an economics department and everybody just looked at him with contempt, of course. And I think the educated class in general. But I guess, uh, you know, with the last 30 years of debate about trade and some of the, you know, the China shock and these sorts of things, uh, I, I mean, maybe there's a, uh, history should re- reevaluate Rospero to some degree, wouldn't you say? Uh, I don't think I'm going to put him on a pedestal, but uh, <laughs> I think you're right. I think it, it, it's very interesting because in the NAFTA debate on the Canadian side of the border, um, so there's a free trade agreement that precedes NAFTA by about 10 years. And then NAFTA then brought Mexico in and, ch- and expanded things and everything. But in that original debate, there was almost no discussion about that distributional side of things. The one person, there was a set of people actually at UBC who were trying to talk about it. So like Brian Copeland was really trying to talk about this and get attention for this. But everybody else was buried in these models that you were talking about where it's like, no, we'll make the pie bigger. Everyone will be better in general and we'll figure out how to worry about any losers later on. And I think you're right that the the economics profession as a whole has come to a greater appreciation of the importance of the distributional problems. and, And that... China shock part of the literature has really, you know, elevated Ross Perot, if you want, although I don't think they reference him very much. Right. I mean, if you look at the standard international trade that we teach in our programs, right, this is mainstream, actually in theory, and that tells us already that there will be winners and losers. There will be massive shifts in, in factor prices. If a developed country is trading with uh, an underdeveloped world where relatively wages are lower, then you know it will have a wage depressing effect. Uh, it's somehow we thought that it was of second order importance. That we'll we'll get to that later. Let's increase the size of the pie, and then that's of first order importance. And then we'll... there was this survey done by Arjo Kramer. Do you remember that? You know, sort of opinions of economists. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kind of yes, no questions, right? And there was one, where is trade a good thing or a bad thing? I think something like 94% of academic economists said yes. Uh, today, if that question were asked to me, I would refuse to answer it. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. There would be important qualifiers and caveats. I think that's a completely reasonable thing to, to say. I think one of the things that we've come to recognize or placed at the center that we didn't used to have at the center as much is what you call frictions. Like these kinds of things that keep people from adjusting, whether it's you know, personal ties, whether it's, I don't leave this job to go to the other job because I know I'm going to have this period of trying to find a new job and it's hard to do and that's costly. And that creates what we call friction, keeps people in place to some degree. And there's been a whole set of models, not just in trade, but really in labor economics and studying labor markets in a big way. That's about, okay, if we integrate this idea of frictions, how does that change our view of the of how workers and firms interact? And it turns out to have really profound implications, including, as you're saying, a much more nuanced view of trade. Right. So these frictions and these distributive effects really uh, lesson from the last 30 years is that we, we need to take them more seriously. Let me get to another issue, David. This inequality, which has come up in the last three, four decades, uh, part of it is inequality among workers, right? So there's a higher college uh, premium. Skilled workers are earning more and unskilled workers are falling behind, broadly speaking. And the other component of this inequality is that capitalists, the division of GDP between a labor share and a capital share, that has also been moving around. So let me uh, show our viewers a couple of graphs. So this one is uh, the real wages of workers at various education levels. The left panel is for men, the right panel is for women. What is obvious is that the most highly educated workers have actually done well so far, right? On average, Uh, people with master's degree and similar, they've had a steep increase. And as you go down the education ladder, the more flatter is the wage trajectory for the last 30, 40 years. 
and especially for the very low, less educated, less skilled workers, it has even declined a bit. And, and similar patterns for women. Wage inequality has gone up within the laboring class. But also, I looked up numbers about, uh, you know, what fraction of GDP goes to labor as a whole of all kinds, you know, college educated, non-college educated. And that seems to be on the decline. So this figure is taken from the St. Louis Fed. And I understand there's some issue about, you know, how to measure capital. But nevertheless, you know, you take from a respectable source, what I see again is a declining trend. So in the beginning of this phase of inequality, labor was earning about two thirds of GDP. And now it's down to almost 60%, right? So that, if true, would be a pretty significant drop. Um, so how do you see this? Do you see uh, both standing today as well as kind of looking into the future that a big driver, I mean, of course, both have happened to some degree, but uh, do you see the inequality, you know, the skill premium as the more important part of it? Or do you see the shift of labor share towards capital to be the bigger, more concerning force? It's interesting. I didn't really make that uh, comparison so um, sharply between the two possibilities. This is the labor share for Canada. Okay, now if you start here, like say 1980, then you would say, okay, here too, we've seen this decline. Although actually labor share since about 2004 has been on the increase in Canada. If you look at the UK, it's actually on the increase since about uh, the late 90s. And over the very long haul, so this is what you were saying before, there's different ways you can handle labor share. The, one of the big problems in measuring labor share is what to do with the self-employed who whose income is partially capital income and partially labor income. And so there's, there's different ways of dealing with that problem. And this is just one way. Um, and th that's why it's not on the exactly same level as the US. It should be roughly, but, but you can see we're actually now, by the time you reach post the last big recession, uh, we're back where we were in the 1960s. So this historic long-term decline is not true in Canada. It's also not true in the UK. It's a very US thing, this notion that labor share over the long haul is really declining. Now, it's important because um, historically, economists have looked at the labor share and assumed like it was so rock solid, it didn't move very much for a long time, that we actually, it was actually built into deep into theories. A whole bunch of macro theories were built around this notion that the labor share didn't move. Um, you can see here that it at least swings in Canada and it's on this sort of long-term decline in the US. The reason I bring up the other countries is because one of the big explanations for this that's been promoted, particularly in the US, is this idea of technological change. And the technological change is in principle gonna show up in both places of the figures that you showed up, right? It's sort of like, on the one hand, bringing in these new sort of computer-based technologies, it's the skilled workers who work with them best. They, in some sense, replace the jobs of the less skilled workers. And so then you get that fanning out pattern that you were showing. And at the same time, in principle, depending on how it works exactly, it could lead to lower labor share. And that's led some people to declare that we're on a path for labor share going to zero. And so I view both of them as being driven by the same force. I, I don't really view one as way more important than the other. I, I see them as really connected. Um, and, and trying to understand how they're moving differently across economies is one way of trying to understand how much of this is in some sense, policy related back to, you know, four horsemen or whatever, and then, and how much of this is uh, driven by technology. One of the things that I feel is problematic about the way technological change is often discussed, just as if it's this exogenous force that is out of our control and is going to take over our labor markets. And, and that U.S. labor trend share has really helped promote that idea. It's like, over this long haul, it's been on the decline. It doesn't seem to be slowing down. This is technology taking over. And I think that's when you sort of see how things move in different economies, you start realizing, well, this can't really be true. Canada and the, economy, Canada and the US, the UK are such similar economies. For them to be on different patterns on this labor share suggests it's something not quite like technological change explained that way, at least. My short answer to your question is sort of like, I view both of them as important. And I think trying to understand how they're tied together is important for understanding what the forces are that are driving them.
So I think that gives me an opportunity to, to talk about one of the papers which I found fascinating. Your paper on whether the demand for uh, cognitive tasks is falling off. Uh, this is your paper in the Journal of Labor Economics 2014. So this is one picture from the paper, which broadly speaking, uh, gives us the de relative demand and supply growth for high level skilled jobs, which require college degrees and higher. The supply of these grew at a steady clip, but and, and the gap between demand and supply narrowed by your estimation. But around 2000, there was a reversal that the demand for these sorts of uh, high cognitive uh, tasks flattened out and supply exceeded it. And uh, there are other interesting graphs in that paper. For example, uh, what kind of tasks are college graduates doing? Are they doing cognitively intense kind of tasks? And, and that increased in 2000, but has been declining since then. Whereas uh, manual tasks are, are increasing even for college graduates. So what I took away from the paper is that you're saying uh, that there was this sort of te massive technological change, especially in the 90s, the computer revolution, et cetera. So that created a higher demand for these cognitive tasks and jobs, but then it kind of saturated, right? And then it tapered off because the technology matured and things were put in place. And, and so that has actually led to some sort of reversal. And, and I found that surprising because the broad brush strokes picture is that, you know, the world is moving in a direction where every next day you, you require more cognitive powers, more education, uh, et cetera, to be able to compete in the job market and get a decent wage. So what's your thoughts on, on that paper and the issues there? I completely agree with you. you know, we all have this feeling things are changing constantly. There are you know, more uh, advanced technologies coming on. And yet this figure is interesting because um, we ended up talking to a number of different journalists at the time this paper came out. It sort of caught a little bit of attention. Um, and I remember talking to several of them who caught on this figure and they're like, yes, this is what's going on to my kids, right? My kids are graduating uh, college and they're getting jobs in Starbucks. I thought the point was they were all going to get these great high tech jobs and they were going to be, you know, making money hand over fist. But instead, my kids are in these other jobs that aren't those jobs that that seems like the, the university education was for. And so this this paper comes from trying to understand those two facts at the same time, right? That if you talk to people, they'll say, yeah, yeah, college graduates have it hard these days. It was harder than when we graduated. On the other hand, there's this sort of expansion. So. Our explanation for that has a lot to do with trying to kind of, in a different sense, reverse the dialogue, the way that people talk about technology and, and the labor market. Like I said, it's very common to talk about it as if it's an exogenous force. And, and you know, like the, the engineers in Silicon Valley talk about it that way. It's like, we will be able to, you know, have robots do everything. We will be able to figure out how AI does everything. And so there's this sort of notion that if the technology grows, it'll just take over everything in this unstoppable force. But in fact, we know that a lot of this is actually governed by economics. And so, for example, the phone in your pocket is not built by robots. It's built by low-skilled labor. And why is that? Because it's not because they couldn't build it with robots. That almost certainly is, is possible at this point. But the economic forces don't go that way. And in this case, what we're looking at is saying, Okay, when these technologies came on, this really big overall technology, okay, this big notion of using computers for computing power for things, we had to really reorganize everything, right? You can remember times when there were more secretaries, for example. So you, you had to basically completely rewrite offices. You didn't just fire the, the secretaries and, and computers were in place the next day. Somebody had to come in, set up the whole infrastructure. There were people who were expert in how this would interact. Web pages used to be hard to create. There was all kinds of work that was needed to set this technology up. There's other examples of these big technologies coming in. When electrification was created, huge burst in work that was related to that, right? So setting up the wires, doing everything to build the infrastructure. You know, no one would claim, we certainly wouldn't claim that that was it. The electrification revolution stopped the day all the wires were up. It had big knock-on effects, but that first really big burst of the setting up stage had passed. 
And that's the way we see this as well. It's sort of what, what the 90s are is this really big reworking of the whole economy. This is the US again, by the way. Um, having set that up, you now are in this situation where people were training thinking, okay, I'm gonna be a software developer and this is gonna be a high paying job. You get into the next stage where this is now done. We've automated some of the, the software writing and all of a sudden you find that the demand for these skills is not as high as you thought it was. It goes down from the trend. And that's the point of this paper. It's like when you actually look hard at this labor market, back to your figure before, only the people at the very top now are doing well. If you figure you showed before where it was fanning out, if you looked at the line with the bachelor's degree and the left figure there and notice how flat that line goes after 2000, there's this sort of notion that the university educated have been doing so super well. Part of it has, but let's be clear, it's not necessarily a very big share of the workforce. Um, the whole lower part is moving fairly in parallel. Bachelors are doing better, as you point out, than the really low educated, but not way, way better. And that was kind of the point of our paper. How can this be? How can we be talking about this thing that supposedly is really favoring the university educated and at the same time have people talk about how their kids can't find good jobs coming out with a university degree? And our answer to that was essentially that you've reached a stage now in the development of this big technology that it is making new advances, but it's not at the same pace as we saw in the 90s. It's not the having to rebuild the whole infrastructure as it, used, as it was before. That's bad news in a way, right? If we take a few steps back and look at the overall economic landscape. And some people have held out access to education as a salvation of sorts, right? That you know, there's this big inequality which is propped up, but if only we can lower the cost of college, uh, maybe sort of improve the quality of high school so that more kids can go to college. You know, Biden has talked about the big Democrats in the U.S. has talked about the access to higher education in a big way. Straight off the bat, you know, from principles of Econ 101, there seems to be a fallacy of composition there. That you can tell one individual that if you go to college, you'll earn much more. But if you do to do that to like half the population and send them to college. I and mean, then of course, high school wages will be depressed. So there's that. But what you're saying in this paper goes beyond that. You're saying that this surge in the demand for skills, that itself would be temporary. And then after a while, the people with this extra education and these college degrees may have to go and work in Starbucks. So for labor as a whole, what does that make us think about you know, education as the path to salvation? Yeah, it's a big topic. So let me say a few things. We have other papers that argue that, in fact, education is not even the salvation in that first sense that you were talking about. One argument has been made that you increase education as a way to reduce inequality because the new graduates compete for the high end jobs and in relative terms drive the wages down. So they sort of stop the fanning out process by getting more educated. But we have these papers that essentially show that the data fits better with a story where firms are choosing which technology to implement. And as you educate more workers, they choose more and more the technologies that use educated workers, which in some sense leaves the lower skilled workers further behind. So this mechanism that's meant to reduce inequality actually for a time at least can increase inequality. There's beginning to be more of a discussion uh, in various places, even including in the U.S., about concerns about meritocracy. And this, I think, comes back to the question about, we've been talking all along here in terms of inequality of income. That's really the measure that we've been using. And I think for good reason, that's of central importance, obviously. But if you think about, say, like the work of Amartya Sen, and then following from that, Martha Nussbaum, and a whole set of philosophers who essentially argue that well-being or on the other end of it, poverty is very multidimensional. We can't actually reduce it just to income. We need to think about how do we create the society we want that involves making sure that people are not exploited, non-domination, they have the basis of self-respect. Those are all the kinds of phrases that are used. And that that requires broader support um, and broader institutions of the right times. So John Rawls, probably the most influential philosopher of the last hundred years, actually spends a bunch of time in the theory of justice talking about meritocracy. And he's very, very worried about meritocracy. And the reason is because he worries that if we create these hierarchies, 
those hierarchies in themselves are unjust. The people who are left towards the bottom without the higher education feel themselves to be less. They have less of a voice in the political sphere. It's inequality in its most pervasive and permanent state. And so he actually argues that one should think, as you think about human capital policy and you think about just sort of ramping it up, that you need to worry about making sure that it's really widely distributed rather than targeted at the people who are the smartest people or something like that. And so for all of those reasons, I really don't think that we should think of education as a silver bullet. It's often treated that way. I think we need to be very careful about it. It doesn't have the direct effects that we necessarily think it does, just in terms of the economics. And if we think of our goal to be to create a more just society, rather than even just worrying about income inequality, education has very complicated interactions with that. And you can really see that in the US where people spend huge amounts of money before university just to get their kids trained up and with the right CV so that they can get into the right universities. And you can just see it building hierarchies in a very pervasive way. And the recent scandal about bending the rules, pulling strings to get the kids in. Right, when you make it that important for the future, somebody is going to try to, I mean, obviously it was wrong. What those people were doing was trying to get the leg up for their kids that everybody now recognizes is necessary. Um, and that's, you know, back to our discussion before, that's not our simple models either, right? In our simple models, our children are going to choose between being a janitor and being a lawyer. And the only reason to choose being a lawyer, I, there's no reason in a life cycle sense, right? It's like, Yes, you get paid more as a lawyer, but that just compensates for the fact that you have to go to school longer and not earn money at the start of your life in order to become a lawyer. But we clearly know that's not true. And in fact, being a lawyer is more than even just the extra income you get. It's about social status. It's about voice in the political process. And we've, in the West at least, not done a very good job of figuring out how to take advantage of the great things that education give without having it build hierarchies that are fundamentally unjust. So the philosopher Michael Sandel, in his latest book, has sort of really spoke, uh, talked very uh, forcefully about this. Yeah. You know, the economies are shifting and education is becoming more important in terms of remuneration. Now, for people in their 40s or 50s, they can't turn the clock back and become 18 again and enter college. So there's an implicit insult when you tell them that you are... Uh, in a sorry state because you didn't go to college or educate yourself or work hard enough. So it's your doing. But also, we tend to use the word skill as equivalent to book learning. Right? I mean, there's a skill in a lot of tasks which require motor skills or craftsmanship. So the US, we could be a very skillful kind of worker in a factory setting in the 1950s or 60s, but you could earn a middle-class life, right? It's not so much skills, in my opinion, it's book learning or scholastic kind of skills, cognitive skills, whatever you want to call it, which has become relatively more important over time. Now, suddenly if things were reversed, if we nerds were told that you'll earn a good amount of money only if you can hit a baseball with great accuracy, if suddenly all our cognitive skills were paid less and that sort of hand-eye coordination was the thing which was valued, we have to think about what would that make us feel. So these uh, underpinnings, which uh, we have to think about. Yeah, I think it comes back also to your point before about how much we've learned about the importance of frictions. Frictions are sort of like barriers, if you want, uh, to, to moving into certain occupations or to other places. To the extent that they exist in moving into these really high-end, high-paying jobs, and that those jobs are paid more than requires to get people to take up those jobs. So they're what economists call jobs with high rents. Then potentially what you're talking about, this sort of university, the scholastic learning becomes the door opener to getting those jobs as opposed to necessarily the great skill creating process. And that's, there's a whole part of labor economics now that's very focused on this question about how should we really think about high-end wages? Are they people getting rents in some sense? They're managing to capture something 
that isn't necessarily just a reflection of how skilled they are. It's about them being sort of in the right job at the right time. And there's various, very interesting evidence on that. So on one end of the labor market, one of the things of real concern back to these questions about inequality is uh, what has been described as the fissuring of the labor market. That if I work for a janitor who cleans a lawyer's office, doesn't work for the law firm, they work for this intermediate firm that farms them out. And there's some really nice papers, among others, by Aaron Dubé, who look at what happened in firms when they outsourced uh, some of those kinds of service jobs. And what you see is these workers who used to be janitors in a law firm, now they're janitors in a different firm, but they work at that law firm. Their wages went down by like 10 to 15%. They don't get pensions anymore. So there's these parts about the, the work relationship, which really has to do with sharing rents. So it used to be the janitor got a share when the lawyers were doing well, even though all the janitor was doing was the same job, still cleaning the same floors. And that's just one piece of evidence that, in fact, a pretty decent share of what is going on in terms of wages is actually really rents rather than returns to skill. That then changes our notion of here in terms of education. Is education just a way of getting access to skills? It also changes our notion of things like minimum wages. It changes our notion of whether it's actually sort of less damaging to interfere with the labor market in order to reach other goals. David, let me move to one topic which I really wanted to talk to you about, uh, which is the idea of basic income. So you were appointed uh, as chair of a committee by the British Columbia provincial government to look into the possibility of instituting uh, basic income for all uh, citizens of British Columbia, replacing the existing welfare infrastructure. And your report was out earlier this year. So it's a fascinating read. So right now there is um, income assistance in British Columbia. So people at a very uh, low income levels, they get cash support from the government. From what I understand, it has the structure that, for example, single adults will get about $1,000 a month. If they have some earned income up to a point, they have an exemption so they can keep their entire check plus earn some extra. But beyond a certain point, uh, they start losing their benefits at 100% rate, right? But every extra dollar they earn, their cash benefits from the government is reduced. First, give us a sense of what was this push for a basic income as an alternative to this system, which I have just described. And what is your overall view about how the system needs to be reformed? Yeah, so I think exactly as you described it, there's a lot of concern a legitimate concern about the way that we deal with people who have fallen on bad times and sometimes sort of fairly permanently fallen on bad times. Um, that we set up a system that is disrespectful, punitive. I mean, sort of Kafkaesque thing about that system is it's not only what you just described, which is you face a 100% tax rate on any earnings, but at the same time, it's a very job search, job focused system. So essentially, once you come onto the system, uh, then they make you search for a job all the time, right? It's basically the idea here, you should be working, you should be working, you should be working. And then they present the system to you that has 100% tax on any earnings that you make. And so in many ways, a very convoluted system. It's a system that does not treat people with respect. It gives insufficient amounts of money. And for all of those reasons, people have turned to the basic income and just sort of said, well, let's do the obvious thing. Let's clear all of this mess out. We won't make it conditional anymore on anything. We're not going to require you to search for a job, et cetera. We're just going to send people a check. What could be simpler than that? Problem solved. Poverty goes away. A lot of what we did in the panel was to sort of ask, what happens if you actually try to design a basic income? What happens is you quickly learn that a basic income is going to be as complicated a policy as the thing that it's trying to replace. So for example, people talk about delivering a basic income through a tax system, and that's very common across countries. We just give it as a tax credit, essentially. So when people file their taxes, they get the money. In Canada, about 14% of people don't file taxes in a year. 
We found this out by linking death records, actually, back to tax records. So we were kind of like, well, how do we find the people who aren't in the, how do we know who's not in the tax records? And then we realized, well, everybody ends up in the death records. So we could work backwards from the death records and find out who we were missing. About three or 4% of people are not known to the tax system at all. And they tend to live in, they tend to die, at least in the neighborhoods that are low-income neighborhoods, et cetera. It's kind of as you would expect. And so... That means if you're going to bring in a basic income, you have to develop this system that's about finding those people and where they are. The other thing about delivering a basic income through a tax system is if I, if I lost a job in February of one year, I would have to wait till the following April in Canada to be able to tell a tax authority that I lost my job and get my payment. So you'd have to create a new system that delivered benefits within the year. Well, both of those things are what the income system system, the welfare system already does. So essentially, we'd have to go back and reinvent the welfare system. The second thing that we really felt quite strongly, and if we think about the society we want, what people want for each other to some degree is, among other things, a feeling of community. These, these sort of bases of self-respect, that there are the material resources, as we've been talking about, about income, but there's also the opportunity to form real attachments to other people, the feeling of support, um, all the kinds of things that come with community. And a basic income to us, the panel, um, which include uh, Reese Kesselman, who used to be at UBC actually, and Lindsay Teds, our conclusion in the end was like, well, a basic income basically says, I'm going to give you a check and wish you well. And maybe you're going to go out and form community. And maybe you're going to go out and find these resources that you need, except usually they're not very big checks. As we disassemble all these other things that potentially are the, the focal point for forming community, it's not clear we're moving towards the society that we really want. It puts a lot of emphasis on liberty and autonomy and very little emphasis on the notion of community as a central element. And so, so those two things together led us to the conclusion that if we didn't think a basic income was a good way to go. It was, we figured you'd end up 10 years from now with a system that's just as complicated as the one you tried to replace but with a different name and 10 years behind on the process of trying to create a more just society with less poverty. So uh, let me pursue that last point a little bit. So you're saying we need an alternative system than just uh, writing checks to people, uh, an alternative system which confers dignity on individuals and uh, helps foster community. Uh, in the report, you talk about services that government also has a duty to provide uh, services to citizens, and that, I guess, would be linked to the notion of community that you're talking about. You also talk about security, that the poor are not the same. You know, somebody among the poor has lost a job, somebody has uh, had an accident, so to treat everybody equally. And that, again, from an individual perspective, means that, you know, the assistance I'll get is independent of what fate I suffer, or what my current state is, whether I'm jobless or whether I have a, uh, an expensive disease. So I guess uh, that is part of the reason why you're uh, sort of somewhat negative on the idea of basic income. So how do the services fit in? What is the kind of services government can provide instead of cash that will further these goals, dignity as well as security of individuals? So two things. One is, I want to be clear, it's not like we're saying income is unimportant. It's not like we're saying don't give anybody any income, you know, we can do it some other way. It's clearly a part of the, the process. So I think the clearest example for me is actually it's aging out of foster care. So in Canada, if there is a substantial problem in the family where there's a belief that it threatens the health of the child, the well-being of the child, the province will take that child out of that house and put them in foster care. So in the care of a different family who get paid for it. It turns out in BC, in, in our province, about two-thirds of the kids in uh, foster care, uh, age out of foster care at age 19, are Indigenous, even though they make up only about between 5 and 10% of the population. So what happens now is sort of a bizarre system. They're trained for independence. It's like they give them cooking lessons, they give them shopping lessons, and they essentially say, at age 19, you're on your own. Um, but we've trained you to be on your own, which is not something we do, anybody does with their children. We don't suddenly say the door is closed. You know, we taught you how to budget. Good luck from here. What we're proposing instead is that resources are put into community supports. So essentially, 
when they reach 19 and they age out of the system, they would choose a particular community group, which would probably be related to their First Nation, to tell you the truth. They would get something that looks like a basic income, but it would be delivered through these agencies so that when they mess up, because all kids mess up, there is a place for them to go back to. And it's part of a community that they themselves are building. And so it integrates both the income side and the community service side. But here, the services are basically done from the community. They're not top down from the government. And that's probably the premier example in our mind. It's interesting, David, one of the descriptions that I've read about these uh, towns in the Midwest, in the U.S., when the factories left and the jobs disappeared, it wasn't just that people lost livelihoods or found it difficult to earn a salary. Some of these small towns had like one major employer, like some big company, auto plant or something. And, and they provided all kinds of public goods, right? So there was a public library, there was a public swimming pool, uh, and these things were regularly maintained. And, you know, there was a sense of community. And so once these companies folded up and left, these public goods also started uh, decaying and disintegrating. And so people are without jobs, but they're also without these places where the community met and which created bonding. So that's uh, one somewhat subterranean aspect which relates to what you're talking about right part of this role has to be played by uh, federal and provincial government providing public goods which cost the community and all of it can't be cashed i would not for a moment say that there is an easy alternative here like this is some kind of silver bullet we'll just do it this way it'll all be better your example is a really good one because you think now okay on the one hand we would want to make sure that those public goods are supported on the other hand, you know, are we going to maintain libraries, et cetera, in places where people have essentially left? I mean, there is a sense in which, at least, you know, in sort of the resource towns in the interior of British Columbia, when the mine goes, same kind of thing you're talking about, people leave. And in some sense, they should leave. Putting everything in stone the way it is now is not, necess- is not really the answer either. And so part of what we want to talk about is, Income does not just solve this. Like just giving these people a check and wishing them well is not the answer. The real answer is very complicated and requires making sure that the people involved have a real voice, but there's not easy answers. I mean, you have to decide when to cut your losses. But you know, there are cities like Detroit, and that's a classic example. I mean, Detroit is not going to disappear anytime soon. Detroit has uh, boarded up houses, you know, decaying playgrounds and parking lots. Now, let me play a devil's advocate a little bit. From reading your report and some of your papers on uh, basic income, one major thing that you're talking about is, of course, funding. I mean, if there's enough money, we can do all of these, right? You can have your foster care funded and you have a $20,000 basic income for everyone. You can go to the extent of having a universal basic income, right? Absolutely no strings attached. And that's going to be hugely expensive. So ultimately... That's the reason for having to make tough choices and having to give up on some of these goals. I mean, partly, I mean, certainly relative to the universal basic income, which, as you say, is hugely expensive. So when we priced out a a universal basic income, essentially with the guarantee at the poverty level, so you sent everybody a check that would be right at the poverty line. So literally no one was in poverty. Um, That was several billion dollars more than the whole budget of the whole government of British Columbia in a year. So the, literally you would have to go to everyone and say, we're doubling your tax rate this year. It's just a political non-starter. You're just never gonna get anywhere close to that. On the other side, and on building more just societies, if we're gonna do something with this portion of our society that at the moment we're not doing a good job with, it's going to require money. We need to find the will to commit some of our resources to this. Places like Canada are just incredibly well-off countries. <laughs> there is a sense in which the basic income people say, and I think it's true, we literally have the resources. We have to figure out a way to do it that feels fair to everybody all the way around the table. What about capital taxation? I mean, people might argue that um, capital has had it easy, partly perhaps because it's mobile, right? And so... If you try to do something in British Columbia, the capital will go to uh, Quebec or somewhere else. So that is, is, of course, a problem. But from a 
justice point of view, isn't there a case to seriously rethink how capital is taxed across the world? Yes, I think there is a serious case. I don't think this is just a VC or Canadian perspective. If you think of Piketty's book and his argument about what's happened with capital share and how we need to tax, tax capital, part of the, the empirical response to that book has been to say, okay, this returns to capital that you're talking about that are so excessive, a huge part of that is actually not the working capital, but the payments for land, the returns to land. And so to me, this is the low hanging fruit. We know that it is something that does distort the economy. We know that, for example, the people of Vancouver who bought homes have essentially cashed in a huge lottery ticket that they were unaware they were even buying. I mean, we're talking about house prices tripling over a span of 20 to 30 years. Like unbelievable amounts of wealth have been in some sense created. And we've not really set up a good form for taxing that. That to me is the place I would start with. It's sort of the thing that we know from economics. As you said, it's a very interesting debate about how much we can tax other kinds of capital. How mobile are they really? I think they're less mobile than in our theory. Like entrepreneurs who have new ideas don't move as easily across borders as one might expect they would in our models. But the economic theory is pretty clear on the other part. We can tax rents and we should tax externalities. So we should start there. And there's a heck of a lot of money that's waiting there to be taxed. I don't mean to sound you know, sort of extreme or something, but I think it's not inappropriate. It's a basically a lottery win. And then on the other side, I think all of us are living through already, like climate change is here. It's not like we're waiting to see whether it's coming. The fires, the floods, the, everything that we're experiencing. So we all know various ways to get to work, one of which is carbon pricing. So to me, those are the places I would go for the sources of revenue to do the things that we need to do. Right. I mean, one example of the kind of, you know, why not tap into the resources, the inelastically supplied resources like land or minerals or what have you, real estate. I mean, Norway is a shining example, right? I mean, the Norway welfare state is primarily funded by their sovereign wealth fund, which is coming from the oil resources, which is state-owned. I wonder whether that should, to some extent, not be an example for other countries which are not as resource-rich as Norway, maybe. They're not sitting on a lot of oil, but they have other things. And uh, maybe they can tax working capital going forward a little bit. Sure, that has incentive effects, but there's a huge stock of uh, already created working capital, right? Which has no incentive effects. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, if you start taxing that heavily, then there's a credibility effect that we won't uh, tax IPOs, but we'll put an equity tax of 10% on all shares that have been created on the stock exchange. That unleashes a lot of forces. But there's a whole lot of wealth. And as we know, wealth inequality is orders of magnitude higher than income inequality. So that is a big part where if some redistribution can be done. I think that's completely reasonable. Let me put another one on the table, which is not immediately obvious as a tax. There are rents in the system. They're sort of scattered through the economy in places. Some are easy to see, like natural resources or land in expanding cities. Others are harder to see very directly, like how much of that big return on a new invention is the drug companies will claim they need these high prices on them because of all the failed attempts that they made that they need to fund. And it's hard to tell exactly where that line is between the excess returns and the the necessary returns to encourage continued investment. But one of the things that's happened in sort of lockstep with a lot of the trends that we're talking about has been a deunionization in a lot of these economies. And one way to think about supporting unions is that you support workers to essentially go after the local rents that they see how much they can get is going to be you know, disciplined by whether the firm can really pay it and the workers will be able to see that. And we need to find better ways. So like the German kind of examples in Norway, it's kind of examples where you set up sectoral labor unions. So the union is working at a level where it sees the benefit. It wants the industry to do well, as opposed to the sort of adversarial model in Canada, the US and the UK, where it's all firm by firm and they all get to hate each other and it all gets dysfunctional. One of the things you talk about in your papers, as well as in the report, is that 
political acceptability of whatever system or reform you come up with is a big factor. You can design something and uh, if it upsets a lot of people and stakeholders and citizens, then its prospects are dim. Especially people who are paying into some redistributive system. If they think that it's exploitative or unjust, uh, then they'll uh, rail against it. Now there, don't we have to strike a fine balance, David? Because you see, in the last 100, 150 years, there have been radical changes to the economic system in the Western world, right? You've had the New Deal, you've had you know, the welfare state immediately after the war in Europe, did away with the gold standard, independent central banks, uh, what have you. And uh, some of the uh, sort of move to the right that we talk about with Reagan and Thatcher from the 1980s, I think it's fair to say that they've changed the way of thinking, right? And once you get to Bill Clinton, for example, in the 1990s in America, the effect of Reagan was there on the Democratic Party and the Democratic president. He didn't uh, cut welfare benefits and so on. So isn't part of policy making also aimed at changing people's hearts and minds uh, instead of taking these kinds of policy and political preferences as given? Uh, part of the effort at whatever level, whether at the level of you know, experts or technocrats, or at the level of you know, elected officials or political parties in the campaigns, it's partly also to change people's minds. So if something seems too radical, like a universal basic income funded by deep capital taxation, maybe the time for that can even come, but we won't be able to do so unless we have some sort of mimetic change, if you will. I think that's exactly right. I think one of the big attitudinal changes that's needed, and I actually think this is within grasp in lots of places. I'm not sure it's within grasp in the U.S. This is another sense in which the U.S. is exceptional. I mean, what we've seen in terms of the level of emphasis on individual rights in the U.S. during COVID, et cetera, has been so extreme. It's made a lot of people despair about whether the U.S. is capable of making the kind of transition that you're talking about. But for other economies, other societies, I actually think it is possible. But to me, the, one of the biggest shifts in attitude that has to take place, I actually think a lot of people think this way already, but is shifting from thinking about um, redistribution as charity to redistribution as justice. When what you think you're doing is giving charity to somebody who possibly doesn't deserve it, but it makes you feel good, so you're willing to do it. If you build a system around that kind of attitude, which is sort of, you know, the old George Bush senior thousand points of light or whatever. It's just sort of like noblesse oblige at best, right? right. Um, versus a notion that, that this is a fair way to think of society as a whole. Um, that's the attitude on change. And let me say, I actually think in a, in a longer term sense, I think that COVID could have been a jumpstart for some of this. At least here, People yeah, actually, Canadians have a tendency to think that governments are a fundamentally effective tool in the first place, much more than Americans ever do, but also sort of like Europeans. Um, and COVID gave a really good example here of how that works. There was a response from the public health system. What was needed was done and people were willing to follow the rules and spending was ramped way up. Checks were sent out every which way. This is the first recession in Canadian history in which inequality went down um, because there was so much money distributed at the bottom. And I also think there was this notion of fairness of sort of recognizing that grocery store workers are frontline workers, these various people in the economy that we more or less took for granted, we now understand how integrated we are with them. Now, let me just say, the analogy to me that a lot of people have brought up, following the Second World War, you get the welfare state, but you don't get it in 1946. You don't get it even in 1950. You really get the, the big institutions built through the 50s and through the 60s in a whole bunch of these Western nations. Um, and my sense is like, after you go through something as traumatic as COVID, or even more traumatic, the Second World War, there's a period, the bureaucracy is, is burnt out. You've spent a lot of your money everybody just needs a break and a party in some sense, right? But the attitudes have changed. We now understand what government can do. We understand more that we're in it together. And I am hopeful that if we keep our attention on it and we work on it, that in sort of starting a few years from now and going forward, that this could be the impetus to making some of the attitudinal changes and sort of more fundamental changes that you were talking about. 
So you are saying that may have made people realize the important role of government in the COVID situation, but also generated empathy and sort of uh, made us uh, appreciate how much role luck or misfortune plays in our lives. I think that's exactly right, because people could see some of the things that just happened in COVID, like I get to work from home, whereas the grocery store clerk who has to face people coughing in his face day after day, obviously can't work from home. I think everybody sees that like element of how much luck is playing into these things. And, yeah. and I really honestly do think that it changed people's attitudes. There were people who thought like this was his break point, like from here on, everything would be different. And, like I said, with the second world war analogy, I don't believe it happens on a dime like that, but I think it's infused in us in a way that we could potentially tap into. Okay, David, let's end on that note. We are practitioners of the dismal science and we have been <laughs> both pretty dismal through the course of this conversation, but you found a really kind of a light at the end of a tunnel in an unexpected way that COVID may have been a didactic moment, a teaching moment for us in terms of uh, greater social empathy and perhaps in the long term, more of an appetite for uh, genuine income redistribution and just societies. David, thank you very much for your time. I really enjoyed talking. Thanks a lot, Brigid. Thank you, David.